Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is March 12, 2014. And Karen Fastenpower has uh, organized this show. Thank you, Karen. Um, we are here to celebrate Open Education Week. And, and uh, a little pre-talk here, I, I'm uh, hearing that it's also Open Education and Easy Week, is what I've heard you guys say, meaning that the technology has to be easy to use. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. Karen, do you want to introduce the folks that you've gathered to celebrate Open Education Week and tell us a little bit about what's going on here? Um, this is, by the way, show 386, uh, so welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Cool. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Karen Fastenpower, and I am excited to be here um, co-hosting this show tonight, and um, it is Open Education Week, and there is a whole great slate of events and projects and information about open at OpenEducationWeek.org, which is linked on the Titan Pad. Hashtag, if you're on Twitter, is OpenEducationWK for week, and it is happening all week this week. And there's lots of great stuff going on. And so I'll Karen, just could I could I already co-host <laughs> and push back and say, you know, here's here's the cynic in some of us, me. Um, like every time we turn around, there's another week, right? Um, and, and when you scratch the surface, you wonder, ooh, wait. Those coding people are connected to this or that, or you know, and so what? Like, what's sponsoring this week? Can you be upfront about that right away? Sure. the The sort of primary um, coordinating group for this is the Open Courseware Consortium, which is a consortium of primarily colleges and universities that got involved in open courses and the open courseware movement that started, I don't know what, 10 years ago or something. Um, but it's very much, a the, the week itself is very much sort of community run by a bunch of us who are interested in open. And I disclose that I'm on the panel for this and receive no compensation for that, no. Um, but it's really, it's yeah, just it's a bunch of people who are interested in open, yeah, right. Let me tell you, anybody who's watching, there's no money in open, no. Actually, that's a good thing to talk about because I, yeah, Vreen and I have talked about this a lot. Yeah, and we are, so before we do that, I want to let everybody okay, sorry, thank you. themselves because we have yes. a very fun panel and I appreciate everybody being here and lots of good friends. So, um, Greg, you want to start? Sure. My name is uh, Greg McVeary. I am a, an assistant professor at Southern Connecticut State University. Um, glad to be on uh, Teachers Teaching Teachers again. Um, it's a phenomenal netcast or show or whatever we call these things that I find myself doing way too much. Um, and in terms of open advocacy, it's, it's something that we have been trying to push and teach with our pre-service teachers. Um, to find ways to build their own curriculums um, and to find different tools so that they can teach open as a as a mindset versus just a, as a you know a curriculum resource. Awesome, Ian. My name is Ian O'Byrne. I'm an assistant professor of uh, ed technologies at University of New Haven, and um, I'll echo what Greg just said. It's a great opportunity to sit down and talk about open ed resources and what we could and should be doing in our classrooms. Nate? Hey, yes, I'm Nate Otto. Um, I fell in love with open back when I was an undergraduate and I wrote my undergraduate thesis on um, finding business models and metaphors to help um, people who create content support their decision to release it openly as opposed to closed. Um, now I'm studying open badges at Indiana University. I'm the project coordinator for the open badges uh, design principles documentation project. Nice to have you here. Verena? I'm Verena. I am not affiliated with any organization. I, I guess that's the whole thing about being open. And I think... Uh, You're affiliated with the internet. I'm affiliated with the internet, which doesn't bring out a lot of cash. I'm a representative of the internet today. Yeah, I'm a representative. I am a Lollipop pure representative. Here. Yeah. I think, but um, I guess my work has been in uh, 
the, the first kind of MOOCs for K-12 and, and playing with that idea and the pedagogy behind it. And, and I think another thing I want to bring up is the first open conference I went to, I actually thought it was about the pedagogy and about how we learn in open environments. And that's how I walked in. And I didn't even know what OER was or what CC was until I got to the conference. So I went in with a completely different mindset. Um, so I think that kind of tells you where I come from. I, I think know. that's great, Marina. And actually, that thinking about that was like one of the first questions I want to throw out because I think we've talked before that you came at it from that angle and I came at it very much from the opposite direction. So I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I was doing tons of multimedia production with students and I was looking for legal resources and somebody said, have you heard of Creative Commons? And I'm like, this is amazing. And for really a couple years, I was just all about sort of OER and the licenses and technical stuff. And I think in the last couple years, I've learned that the whole open thing is a whole bigger thing that really doesn't have to do with licenses and maybe licenses don't matter or maybe you know people spend too much time so I'll throw it out to everybody w w open learning as a general idea versus open educational resources which we we in the community very narrowly define as resources that are licensed in a way that people can reuse remix and redistribute them what are the overlaps and connections between those two things? What's the really important part? You know, where 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 do they overlap? I'll jump on that grenade first. <laughs> you, want. Um, you know, I I initially thought of open as a way to cover myself and cover my teachers and Creative Commons licensing and make sure that the work I was doing and the stuff that my kids were playing with and remixing in class wouldn't get us sued into the Stone Age. Um, and that's one of the first venues into it. Um, you know, I, I would... You know, what, what age students were you worried about at that point? Uh, this was when, when I was teaching middle school and high school in Western Mass, teaching eighth grade and then high school students. Um, and then as I started working in my doctoral program, I work with, you know, uh, grad students at UConn, uh, but primarily my middle school kids, you know, we'd have them, I, I'd want them to edit video, and so where is there a lot of cheap, free video that you can remix in the Internet Archive, you know, and at this point, nobody's knocked on the door yet, um, so then as I kept playing around with it, you know, I, I would play with open source software, um, but then just recently, uh, through working with uh, Mozilla on the Web Literacies calls, you know, on one of those calls, Doug Belshaw um, reprimanded me, you know, and said, you know, open is an attitude. And ever since then, I've been like, what is he talking about, you know? And and slowly, it's starting to make sense to me that it's it's more, you know. So I want to hear what everybody else has to say about it. What does this mean to you? Hey, I'll, I'll step on the grenade next. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. I think open is an attitude, and then from that attitude, you get things like willingness to use this or that license, um, and just, you know, you go out there and you put things together and share the results back, and um, you, you let go of some of the worry that comes with um, doing that. Yes, open isn't closed. There, I'm done. <laughs> No. Wait, I gotta tweet that. Yeah, we know where the grenade went off. <laughs> yeah, I just tried to put the pin back in. Um, no, but Nate and Ian are right in the fact that it isn't. You know, I think we get so hung hung up in what is OER and is this Creative Commons or oh, but I'm a teacher, so it's fair use. But I'm more about am I using the internet for self-driven, peer kind of interest learning topics. Um, to, to kind of personalize my own curriculum. I mean, we can still have those standards, but the thing is, are you basically learning in the open and making, I know there's, you know, legal justifications and reasons that a lot of teachers don't do this or are afraid to do this, but to me, that's what it is. It's, it's I try to encourage my teachers to not just use OER, but to learn in the open by making their thinking public and visceral and out there. Um, and I'm, I'm with Ian. I think like working with what the Mozilla Foundation has done 
or just watching that um, project grow. And if you're not in their little web makers community on Google Plus, they're they're having like, these little daily open ed challenges um, that are fun little prompts that I encourage everybody to go check out and read. Um, but yeah, so for me, that's it. It's can you can you are you willing to just take your learn build your own learning by using materials that you find and then reflect on that learning in places where everyone can access. Yeah, that's the big thing is it's learning and reflecting in the open. To me that's the most important piece. You know, it I think we're out on the we're out in the forefront of this. And I want the teachers that I work with to go out and learn and, you know, we have to break the new ground. So I want my teachers to reflect openly. Tim Flanagan and a bunch of other students that all of you know and have talked about um, you know, he's one example of a student we had that's learning and interacting online and making mistakes just like we all are, but we're doing this openly so that the people that come after us can learn from what we have already tried to do. So there's obviously a lot of discomfort with these ideas. <laughs> um, and, I'm, and, and I think some of the discomfort in... The Have we described that discomfort yet, though? I, I only hear. Well, I think yeah. Greg and Ian started talking about some of it is some of it is legal concerns, and some of it is school districts who are really cracking down on we don't want teachers to have a public identity. Oh. Um, so I I think some of it is that legal concern, but I think there's a lot of discomfort that has nothing to do with legal concerns or or fear of sort of institutional repercussions, but it's just. I mean, I don't know. What is it? Is it, it, it? I think some of it is that people have never been asked to do this before, and they literally don't know how to do it. What? What? It's a huge risk, and it really hurts when you get burned, and you get burned a lot. Like I'm not going to say I don't get burned a lot. And what I mean by burned is if I I say something in Twitter, and it's pretty innocent usually. I'm not one to attack. And people can attack me right now for saying that, but I am not one to attack people in Twitter. I don't think that's appropriate. I think the idea of open learning is this transparency and modeling who I am as Marina. Real life also is represented in Twitter. So if um, someone literally um, the idea, this new idea, well, we'll call it a new idea of digital identity, and we're trying to model it for our kids too, and get them to think about this in the big picture, and yet we will attack each other as adults on Twitter and it is an attack when somebody blatantly says something nasty about you or accuses you or jumps at you. Um, it's like a form of communication obviously and you wouldn't do it in a face-to-face -face room so having that in a transparent open environment that's what I mean by it hurts because sometimes you're just shocked at what people say or at a blog post that <laughs> <laughs> totally taken the wrong way. I suggested that Commander Hadfield was a wonderful educator, and that got taken the wrong way. I, I, I and I'm going to say that now to all my my people who thought I was crazy to suggest that because teachers are educators and not Commander Hadfield. And I was saying if he can do this from outer space, can we think about how we could do it on Earth? That was that was the point. So and it hurt, like it really hurt. And then the comment was, "Well, you live in the open; you should deal with it." Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I think. Yeah. Why would I do that then, as a teacher, if I get? That, but this is what Dana Boyd was talking about. You know, I mean, we're making a choice to live and learn in the open. You know, we're we're hopefully being thoughtful about the ways that we express ourselves. The risk is, you know, with the teachers that I'm working with. Five, eight years ago when I was teaching, if you had a Facebook account, you'd hide it or else your principal, you know, you'd get fired. And now, it's it, now when you go in for a job, principals will, will Google you ahead of time to see are you technologically savvy or not. You know, and so you can create that repertoire. Um, in higher ed, um, a lot of my colleagues had no idea what to do. Um, we were just at LRA and I was blogging about it and we had a big session where we had some senior researchers and then some brand new doc students that no one could agree on whether or not we should be open. But this is part of that Kristoff piece that came out. Um, you know, we had senior researchers talking about the fact that they had publications pulled because they were blogging about it and talking about it online. We've had doc students, really promising doc students, told by advisors don't you dare put anything online, don't you dare blog, don't get on social networks. 
because you're wasting publications and your tenure committee is not going to count this, this open online activity. And so there's a lot of people in academia who don't know what to do with all this. So there's a lot of risk. I could, I just turn in my third year tenure materials and I turn in a giant binder like this and the first couple pages were QR codes <laughs> saying, here's my blog. Here's my blogging for IRA. Here's all these different things that I do online. That's the real me, not these other papers and service and all that other stuff. So that's one of the risks that we have. I think there's a lot of that in K-12 too. I mean, there yeah. still are a lot of districts that have policies that say teachers cannot have Facebook pages. Or blogs. I mean, yeah. I mean, I know, I know personally people who've lost their jobs because of things they've said in open spaces. And I think, I think, that's, the the I think most that's one aspect. But. The, most, um, the worst case that Ian and I ever saw, we worked with a district in, a, in Pennsylvania and to make sure that the kids weren't were obeying copyright, they disabled um, uh, control paste or, um, or copy paste. <laughs> the they, right you, couldn't, you couldn't right click on the mouse because they didn't want you copying and pasting. Okay. Like literally, like they just they took out all the shortcuts for copy paste uh, because they were worried. That they could, I mean, I, it's it's probably the most it's it's the most extreme example I've ever heard, and I, I love to bring it up. Um, but yeah, they 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 just took all the right clicks out of the mice, so kids could not uh, copy paste. What about that? Like the mindset piece, though, that because you share and because you take the risks. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't know Ian. I wouldn't know Mark. I wouldn't know Karen if I hadn't taken the risks. Mm -hmm. I met Paul at Educon. I didn't even know what Educon was. <laughs> uh, it, it. What about that piece and the fact that? Teachers haven't, we haven't quite got to that idea yet that sharing actually pushes you forward, for lack of better description. What do you think, I don't know, what do you think about that? I agree, because there's a certain amount of serendipity involved in the learning process. You know, most of us in the face-to-face -face environment that we live in, you're that techie geek that walks <laughs> around, and they're like, oh, here he comes again, he's going to talk about blogging now, everybody look the other way. But then you can go online and dip into it, and you can instantly connect with people just like you that are interested in pushing the boundaries just like you. And you all push each other's ideas, and you're all out on that peninsula together trying to figure out what this all means. But is it also because, like, we enjoy that? I mean, we're all sitting here. It's, it's 9 o'clock my time. And, um, you know, so is it, is it a mindset or is it a hobby? Um, am I trying to am I trying to learn, or is maybe my hobby is learning? Um, and so I, I do wonder about that. Like when I think about the amount of time, um, and I did put in my same thing. Like because um, on the a research listserv, I was basically accused of being a mindless blogger because I'm not going after journals. Um, but I wonder, like, not I, I hate to say echo chamber. That's not that's not, and I'm not getting at what I'm trying to say. But I think we're all here because it's something that we find value in. Um, so I wonder, you know, maybe are we any different than the, the the woman who or man who's in the knitting club and goes to the local church to learn a new knot or whatever it's called, the knitting that you do? That's Is not it, such a bad thing. No, well, I don't and that's <laughs> and that's open learning, especially if you do it in in that sort of learning circle environment. Probably the best learning experience I've had in the last several years is starting up a seed library and not being sure how it was going to evolve and it brought our community together and we have a very diverse community of every radical political <laughs> persuasion you can imagine and people came together around the idea of growing our own food for very different reasons but it immediately became a peer learning environment and there it's it's pretty leaderless and distributed learning and I mean it's it's open learning it's amazing that's, maybe that's what I was trying to get at that we don't have to be in digital spaces like open work open learning works in our you know offline meet spaces too totally um, right and yeah. I think in both spaces you know that online and offline going out into those open spaces means embracing some vulnerability. I mean, like, my project might fail, 
you know, it's very attached to your own reputation when you do that. And, um, you know, I mean, we recognize since we we tried it and we realized there are benefits um, that, I mean, no risk, no reward. There's some people in the chat just sort of talking about you have to sort of endure that risk of vulnerability in order to get these rewards. But, I mean, at the same time, as proponents of this style of learning, um, you know, we have to sort of be kind to people who that, that burns and, you know, recognize that, that there, is, there is risk and it's real. Yeah. Right. And I think that's as much in face-to-face -face as it is in online spaces, although I do agree, Verena, that people are sometimes quicker to say things they would never say to your face. Yeah. The windshield factor. Okay. <laughs> what you would say inside your car, you wouldn't say behind a, or behind a windshield. You wouldn't necessarily say it on the street. That's what I call it. Right. I think about that. But so, the, I like and the there's mini. a possible ganging up that happens too. Right? Yeah. I the peer and and then and, but the funny thing is usually then you direct message or, or connect or call Ian out and like Google and say I need some help. <laughs> Like, you know, and, and can you do that in a regular, like, water cooler conversation at your school? Not necessarily, because the person might not be there unless, I guess, you texted them. So you're using technology in an open way to help you to support what you believe in. But I kind of agree, it is kind of a hobby. Although, did I never got to learn this way when I was young. And so maybe that's what I get off on now. I was bored out of my mind because it was just what what you see is what you get. Hey, that, that kind of works, doesn't it? So, you know, it's what we don't have that, that excites me and learning about what we don't have and connecting with all these people that I don't know and these ideas that I don't understand. And it's so easy. That's what open learning to me is all about. So I got a question. Um, given that there's risk and there's reward, and I think what Greg was getting at earlier is that this is our passion. You know, this really is our passion that we do this and we push these boundaries. One of the questions I've had in, in you know, coordinating my program, you know, having teachers use technology and make them experts is a couple of them have said, well, you know, it's, you need, it's, it's not appropriate to not be the expert the back and forth expert on a tool um, and expect teachers or students to use it. So the question I have is knowing the risk and reward, is it appropriate that we champion open and try and push others into open? So teachers that are new or learning how to use technology, given all this risk and reward, is it appropriate that we advocate for them and push them to be open online? I think it depends how you define open. I mean, I think, you know, what we're talking about right now is, is peer learning and nobody's the expert and having a passion for whatever you do. I think, I mean, I hope, I hope we all advocate for that. I don't know, like, the technology piece of it. I, th I feel like I've gotten further away from that because the best experiences I've had are with people who aren't in the technology space. And I, I mean, I think you know. How do you open this up to them? Is a question I have. So, Ian, you were asking that about adult students, or I mean, yeah, I mean, that, mostly my adult students, but I could see it playing out. I could definitely see it playing out in K twelve. But part mm -hmm. of the issue is, you know, the, the acceptable use policy and protecting your protecting your kids. Yeah, but but what I've found, I mean, and I err on the side of open with my kids' work. Um, encourage them to publish right away as soon as possible kind of thing. Um, and there is sometimes some problems with that when a kid doesn't want to do that and they realize that I've pushed them to do that. But not very often. More often, the worries about that are compensated by the rewards. Yeah. In other words, their, their, their worries are, are turn out to be unfounded, um, usually. I, I do think it should be everybody's choice, though. I mean, I do. I think that it's important for people to, whether they're teachers or students, whoever. I think it's important to talk about what open means and what the, you know, not to scare people, but it should be their choice and they should understand what it's about. So there's a, there's a right to privacy in open learning. You're saying like everyone has a. Um, and going off what Paul is saying, I don't think I don't think it's our students that are those that are apprehensive t to learning, and publishing in the open. It's 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 a societal it's the systems above those students that I think have more of the worries. But and who I 
I wish I could find the link. The um, you know, the the Bill of Rights for Digital Learning, and I think mm -hmm. privacy was like one of one or two of the on this that second like uh, choices. Mm -hmm. um, but then, Karen, I, I run into this responsibility all the time because I, I have my students in all of my classes, and even when I was teaching sixth grade, first thing they do is, you know, get their blogs, and I start publishing, and I say, well, you can make it private if you want. I've never gone through right. in, my responsibility to teach them how to make it private, though, or is it like, right. I, I just, I'm going to say that. Private? I was going to say that, too. Even if, you know, on each post you give a student a choice, there's a default, right, that yeah. you start with, so, it, Yeah. What, what do you do, Paul? Is it default? Um, I mean, you know, public we, public? we don't do what Karen suggested. <laughs> yes. um, everything's public right away. It's all there, man. <laughs> so, and we haven't had much trouble with it, though, so I don't know. But I, I think about it once in a while. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'll say. And I did have a, a kind of a... Uh, question on the other, maybe on the other side of the open question. And so, if if I if I have an open attitude and I use materials in open ways, does that give me a right to copy? And I've done this recently, a uh, Pearson video that, and then use it in an open way. Yeah, as long as it's a link. Yeah, a link. You can't if republish you link, it. Then I yeah, but I did. Well, then you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I know, but but, you guys, but, here, but here's where I'm pushing back. I'm saying okay. I'm saying I'm saying. Look, I, if opens an attitude, where's the line? And so that's this is a great okay. conversation because I think this is where, I mean, I I am an in the box person on this, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm I really believe copyright laws are for a reason, and and I know a lot of people in the open community are not that way. They're like fair use should be broader, therefore we're just going to act like it is, and and that's not how I feel. But I'm sure others on this panel will express that feeling. But by the way, the, and part of the reason I bring it up is that's where most students are too. Yeah. Yeah, so, and I think it's our responsibility as teachers to. Can Karen and Verena, can you guys explain to the audience what you mean by a link is okay, but the video is not? What do you mean? Yeah, you you can you can link or embed. Anything that's on the internet legally, because you're not you're not technically republishing it. That's different than copying and pasting it directly into your whatever it is. Yeah, or, but that, that because that's technically gone, that's redistributing it. But that link would have gone to a YouTube place and grab blocked, by the way. So I couldn't link to it. <laughs> well, that's was probably Pearson's choice, or would, that was your district. It was choice. Pearson's choice. Yes. Well, that I would say that is the right of corporations <laughs> in America. <laughs> Um, I mean, that's a business model. Just like I wouldn't say Pearson or yeah, anybody else <laughs> should publish everything openly because I think everybody has to make that choice. And I think teachers have to make that choice, too. You know, there's a lot with this pay, these pay sites for teacher lesson plans now. I think it's every teacher's choice, and I would never say everybody should do that. But I think there's a different issue of the law and what you, you know, what people, how people think so it should be in there for. If I took your website, threw it into an iframe, and then put it on my website. Am I linking or am I republishing? Yeah, so that's like <laughs> deep, that's deep linking, right? Technically you are technically you're legally okay because you're not republishing. You're you're embedding. Karen did well, it. it certainly helps you if you are very clear about what you're doing as you know here at the top of the frame you right. say, oh, this is Karen's website right here. Yeah. Yeah. And you should it's always attribute the source no matter if it's open or anything. But, and you do yeah. I mean you do have very uh, to the Pearson video, you do have some fair use, um, uh, you know, claims you could make, but you have to go sort of through that. If you're in the U.S., you go through that four-factor test right. and talking you know, about how much of the video you're using, what the effect on its market value, um, the purpose or nature of the work, and you know, I forget what the fourth one was. But. Well, I want to. This brings out the interesting question, though: is what is open? <laughs> because when I mm -hmm. discussing OER with teachers, they immediately do that, Paul. <laughs> like they immediately yeah. go, "Oh, well, Pearson into this or what?" And it's usually a publishing company that's done a video or whatever online. And then I'll explain to them why or why not. And then I try to lead them over to like the OER. I'll call them yeah. repositories, for lack of a better word, so that we can look at things differently. And and I guess maybe that's more the mindset because it's open and I can remix it and I can share. And then in that, Karen and I have talked about some of it. You can't even format or remix like you can't. You know how you can't do anything with it really. So I don't know if that's open. And then what about MOOCs that close? I like I don't even know how they are a MOOC if they're open for six weeks and then they close. That I, like that doesn't even define MOOC to me. If I can't the access mop. the content. <laughs> 
the, the mock or the whatever. Yeah. So what is open? Like honestly, what is open? So if I'm as a consultant, I'm supposed to explain these things, and I go, well, <laughs> there's a continuum, or there, like let alone licensing. What is open, really? Well, there's a lot of definitions too, and as open yeah. has become popular. It, Pearson and every other publisher is yeah. saying we're open, and it doesn't. It doesn't certainly meet the open definition of open licensing. That and there is a consensus definition of that in the community. I, the reason I think this is important, and this being a stickler about this stuff, is because I think it, it's a 21st century skill that matters to students when they go into the workplace. And there's been numerous cases of students who haven't got this and they go into a big deal job and copy and paste something and get a company into huge trouble. So I do think it matters. But um, I'll, I'll bring over a comment from the community from Peggy who says you're violating someone else's rights when you violate copyright law, which I think is you know, yeah. valid. But part of, part of what's worth noticing, though, is that my students experience learning about open as a limit. <laughs> you know that that there are lines. So so you you know you mean I can't just go on Google and search for any image. You want me to search for Creative Commons images. That's fewer images that are available to me to use, right? So, but if they're going to go yeah. work at a design firm and be a designer and they're going to do a brochure, they need to know. And I you know I always say because a lot of teachers will say to me, I really want to use this, and you know, and what I usually say is like, here's the law, and here's the gray area. And make your own decision. And I mean, the one reality that's worth considering is teachers are not getting in trouble legally, for, or nor are students, for the most part, for breaking copyright law. And I'm not saying that's a reason to do it, but I think people who sort of stir up a lot of fear of, like one of the questions people ask me now is, what if I get an image that's Creative Commons licensed, and then later it turns out it really wasn't? Am I in trouble? And I'm like, that's just, that's so down the fear factor <laughs> scale that I can't even, like, just don't worry about it. Because in reality, even in a corporate environment, all you're going to do is get a letter, a takedown letter. And yeah. you take it down and life goes on. I mean, nobody's going to jail for this. So no, that's as, as so out of the box thing. Germany. Yeah, there you go. A hard, well, for instance, like to give you an example, a hard thing for me to um, to navigate is I like a lot of the art on DeviantArt.com, and when you read their terms of service, they say that the you know the artists will tell you their, how they're going to license it, but a, a lot of the artists don't. Um, but a, they can, by default, you can't download the image, but the artists can allow you to download it. So I'm like. Are they giving me some kind, by allowing me to download it, are they giving me some kind of explicit permission? Um, and I'll always send them a message being like, hey, I want to use your mess image, but they might have put that image up four years ago and never logged back on to DeviantArt again. Um, and so, and I, I love it. I, I get a lot of my artwork, and I do try to remix it and, and play with it to kind of make it my own, but I can hang out in DeviantArt all day long, and I really try to respect the copyright of those artists, but it's a it's a hard place to navigate and figure out. Yeah, but I'm going to push back a little bit, and I'm just going to be devil's advocate because that's what I like to do. Um, I, I think that we're in between two models. Like, I totally get copyright, and I totally get IP, you know, and, and the way we need to protect copyright creators and, and, and show ownership. But, you know, we're in a, a remix mashup culture. You know, we see tools like Mozilla Popcorn where you can remix videos so I can take my Run DMC video that if I uploaded it, yeah, I'd get in trouble. But if I use somebody else that broke the law and I use their stuff, I'm fine. Yesterday I spent a lot of time with Greg talking to the people at Poetry Genius and Rap Genius. And I was like, this is great. Are you guys ever afraid? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm copy-pasting Robert Haas's poetry up into Poetry Genius, and I'm waiting for like Robert Haas Esquire, you know, to knock at my door and be like, "What are you doing?" Um, so I think that we're in between two models, you know, and and we have to respect, you know, where we've gotten to, you know, this point, but then also try and figure out what are the best practices and what should copyright and IP and what should open mean later for our students when they grow up. And we should all push back against policy and law that we don't think is right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think all of all of us on this panel would certainly probably agree that copyright law has just gone way too far 
in a certain direction because of political interests, and we should push back against that. But and you see, we should do that simultaneous with just abandon. Yeah, the, no, the no, I don't think we should law. abandon it. But we see, you know, I'm in the same boat with with um, you know, with Greg and also with Paul. Is that you know, I want my students to use Creative Commons images. I want them to go out and go the extra mile to find content that they can use. Um, but you know, it's things are all out of whack. You know, now civil disobedience online is I'm going to go online and I'm going to download the torrent of like True Detective or Game of Thrones because Netflix won't give it to me. So now that's how we see civil disobedience online. Well, we, I, I think my, my brother-in-law is a photographer and I didn't know that he can track all the images and who takes them. Through his website, that's why I I should have known that, but I didn't know that. So that's something kids should know. Like that's something mm -hmm. that we should be thinking about. Um, yeah. So it's getting back to the non YouTube. Necessary. Also, you can track who uses your YouTube's. So yeah. Well, I'm sure it's everywhere, but we just don't mm -hmm. like think it through. But isn't that important to know? Like if you're in, especially if you're in K to 12, because it's part of your identity, part of who you are, part of how. Yeah, and I know there's that that idea that they're it, they're never going to get caught. You know, Justin Bieber is a perfect example of <laughs> the idea that never nothing's ever going to happen to me to the extreme. But we see that a lot online. But there's a lot of stuff being tracked, and really, who who is acting upon it and not. And I think that's part of what you're getting at too, Karen. That maybe what's reasonable and what's not, what's fair share. I don't know. But we should know why. I think, I think an interesting thing is when you talk to kids about this, they're immediately engaged in this conversation because they see themselves as copyright owners and content producers, yeah. and they go right to that instead of, what am I doing wrong? They're like, oh, That's I have all these rights. Change too. Awesome, yeah. Nate, I want you to um, just say briefly what you said in chat, because I thought it was so brilliant, and I want people who don't have the benefit of seeing the chat to have heard this. <laughs> sure, I'll go anyway. Someone was just, um, Peggy posted that it's, um, if you're violating um, copyright, infringing copyright, you're violating someone's rights, and I just sort of you know, I mentioned that this is a government-provided uh, monopoly right um, that's defined by our laws. The, uh, it's not a, a natural r rights argument like, um, you know, a lot of what you'd consider human rights. And mm -hmm. so if you are infringing on, you know, on a copyrighted piece of work, you know, you... You are breaking the law if you if you know you if you don't have a good fair use defense. But um, you know it, there, it's a slightly different question than if you're violating someone's moral rights. And a lot of people who view you know copyright as real like hardcore property would say that it's the same that the moral rights and the legal rights are are currently identical. And and we may here on this panel disagree you know with with how much of overlap there is there. Um, and if you know so. You get into these questions about civil civil disobedience as well. Good thoughts. I want to shift the conversation a little bit, as much as I could go on on this for two hours. But no, okay, you can, and I want you to to. But can I just ask though? Um, like this is not the fun part of open education week, right? No. <laughs> um, no. But but is it is it, is it considered what you know we should be talking about around this or not? Yeah. I, the I first don't, question always comes up. Uh -huh. yeah. But I feel like the conversation, and maybe it's because where I am personally, but I feel like the conversation is much more moving toward open learning and open spaces more so than copyright and technically what's open. And, you know, everybody's at a different place and different organizations have different things that are, are important to them. Um, but so I'm hearing there. more yeah, conversation. We're, 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 yeah, so I want to talk about what... You know, given that we all think that there are benefits of open learning for students, and and I think for teachers is where my real interest is. How can we encourage more teachers to think about or see the benefits of this, mm -hmm. and especially for teachers? And some of us have had this conversation around um, thinking about how to get even just open resources in the narrower sense used more in K-12 education, how can we support that? What, you know, for, especially, I think about the teachers who say, this is really interesting, I want to do this, but I have no idea how to do it and I don't have any support. How do we move toward that? 
not having good role models and not having support is really tricky. Um, one thing I, I thought, as soon as I sort of discovered the experience of open learning, you know, I had one of those like really meaningful personal experiences. Oh man, this is so different. But you know, like as a couple years down the line, I sort of realized that. It gave me new tools, but I, I was learning in similar ways. When I was actually learning in the traditional system, it was because I'd connected to cool ideas through you know, good mentors and good peers. And now I can do that out in the open with the tools that I find out there and the spaces that I, I go to inhabit. Um, but it's, it's the same sort of like network building and connecting process. I think it's like, when, well, this group in general will present at conferences, for example. We're, we're the type that might present at conferences. And I've started to say, I'm not going to stand there for an hour and lecture. So I start changing the way I'm doing things. Then I bring up the resources I use. And I brought up the how to use Google as an LMS at my last one, they were gone. Like, the group was gone. They were just obsessed with the Google community. And so all you can do is model it kind of everywhere you go. And that includes changing your practice and things like conferences or wherever you are. Or when people ask you to speak or talk, take advantage of the fact that that's an opportunity to, to talk about, not talk about open learning, but talk about, like, be that open learner. That I, well, when I studied open learning last year, I separated into open leadership, OER, and, and open practice. And so I think open leadership is, is what you're getting at a little bit here. Yeah, I think it's two things. I think it's, um, you know, one is Greg and I learned a long time ago when, you know, you would do a conference, you go to, like, IRA or NCTE, um, you never put technology in the title, you know, because then you're talking to the, you, everybody's drinking the Kool-Aid already, so you, you call it, like, non-traditional narratives, or our favorite one is we talk about poetry, and then all the poetry come, people, you know, come in, and then you shut the doors, and you're like, surprise, it's technology. Um, and then the other thing that I do now is when I go do a talk, I'll put my slides up on Google Presenter. A lot of times I'll either record the talk ahead of time, or I'll record it during the talk, and then go in and say, okay, today we're going to talk about whatever the case may be. This lecture, this talk, this whatever, it's already online. And it's online, and here's my blog. It's already linked up there. You can also see future stuff I'm going to do, and you can see some you know, stuff from the past. So last summer I did a talk like once a week, and people were like, so let me get this straight. All of your stuff is just out there like we can just look at it and use it for free and so like next year we can come back and I'm like yeah and you know some of the teachers and even some of my colleagues at the at the Digital Literacy Institute at URI some of my colleagues that you know they were like why the hell would you do that mm -hmm. you know that was literally one of the questions from one of my colleagues and and, and it was also because you know I was building a MOOC it was like why would you do that like why would you put this openly out there online? And I'm like, why not? People will be able to use it. It's You're going to sit there. You might wonder two weeks later what I was talking about or what I'm doing a year later. So that's what I do is I just put it out online, publish it on my blog, give people access to it before, during, and after, and then try to hopefully create a conversation. So I'm really interested in the teacher perspective yeah, of, um, and, and, and there there are a couple. One is one is um, learning to create open resources, right, mm -hmm. with with the with an audience in mind beyond your own students. Changes how you create those resources, and that's mm -hmm. that's an interesting learning process that teachers need to go through. But also even thinking that you're going to be using other people's resources. Right? It's not something that's that's demanded of you. It's not something that you know your district is making you do. It's something you're building on other people's shoulders around. Um, changes how you plan too. Wow. So I think both of those things are really important and not easy things for especially young teachers to start doing. And so that's yeah. I think there's a third element to student choice, and so that I want to add in, and then to, to the, your two salient points is mm -hmm. 
the openness of allowing students to kind of design their own learning. I mean, yes, you can have your, your objectives and your standards, but with OER resources and open ed mindsets, are you giving your students the amount of freedom to kind of design their own learning spaces? Which is, that's even harder, I think. That's the hardest of the, the, the first two that you mentioned, I think, which were how do you find OER resources and how do you get comfortable with using other people's resources? Mm -hmm. And then I think the third step is how do you allow students to kind of give them more control over designing the curriculum itself? Um, which, I, Paul, you're great at just with, with, with the work that you do. Um, so it's something I think that you're, you're very skilled at doing. Um, I don't think, I'm, I, I'll be honest, I never really got there with my sixth grade students. Um, but, yeah. but even on Youth Voices, I've got to say, it's, 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 um, it's a learning curve that many of the teachers who use, use Youth Voices haven't, aren't there yet. Um, so that all, everybody creates materials for their students, mm -hmm. but creating them in a way that's available for other teachers to use is, is, a, is a shift um, for, most, for all of us. Do you think they see a value in that? Because I do think that, I, I think probably one of the best selling points for OER is as a tool to improve teacher practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I think it's hard to communicate that sometimes, but I think that's something that everybody can get behind. How does it, why does it improve? Well, make the case. <laughs> well, it puts, I, I, it, you know, I, potentially it puts the control of the curriculum more in the hands of the teachers and students, right? And I think I think we've seen you know for whatever you think about Common Core, I think we've seen some interesting examples of people using open resources or taking publisher developed open resources and really taking the learning process to a new level through customization. Can can I add to one thing Paul was kind of saying though? It when you're talking about building the OER, it's about not. It's about a teacher accepting that you don't have to make everything yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And I think yeah, that's, that you don't that's, that's right at the beginning. Yeah, do yeah. you think? Yeah. You don't have to remake everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that yeah. is that mindset will take you the furthest, shall we say. When you realize that you can build upon others, other people have done it, mm -hmm. um, or whatever, it saves you time, it's more economical, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like that's where you, that's where I see the benefits in practice and change. But by doing that, and saying it's not all about me. <laughs> Whoa, you're just changing your mindset. Good <laughs> teachers are really. Oh, sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Which is um, when you're presenting other people's material, you're the tutor of that instead of the expert in it, right? Yeah, so that, that expert. That's a, that's a shift. Yeah, well. it's a shift. And and a co-explorer. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be perfect initially. It could be something that you build up over time and you improve upon and. Take somebody else's work and ideas and tweak it a little bit for your kids. Um, you know, I mean, back to Paul's point, one of the challenges that I've seen is teachers, you know, and, and it's in the middle of Paul and Karen's point, is sometimes teachers want to have the open ed resource and want to create that, but then there's pushback from the schools. The schools say, no, we want to give you the time and the money and the support to build these modules and these materials, but build it up here in our school Moodle and we're going to farm it out to the different schools and it's going to be our property now. So we're going to give you the time and support, but don't you dare copy paste that over to your Google site or your Wikispace or whatever. I don't see much of that in K-12 though. I think in K-12 people, there, there isn't the ownership of content issue that exists as much in higher ed. Not in lesson plans, but there is in full-blown curriculums. Yeah. When, when I mean, districts write curriculums, they, they watermark them, they, you know, hmm. they lock them down. Um, but I always tell Maybe teachers, they don't know. Yeah. Um, good teachers are really creative, and great teachers steal from the good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think that's when we talked about, yeah, for those of you who got to see the Connected um, Learning TV episode yesterday on DS106, and mm -hmm. listening to how they built the assignment bank, I don't know if anybody's really familiar with it, but just for the audience out there, it's this kind of, it's a community, it's not a, it's just, it's a, I'm not going to go really into it, but they just have this assignment bank where, people can add up different assignments, create assignments, and then other people can either can do those assignments or use those assignments. And that's really the kind of system we need educators to build. And I'm just thinking in my head, like, I'm so bad at tagging my own posts on my own blog um, and how important, you know, if you were to get, say you had, like, a 
a thousand teachers contributing these like lesson plan and ideas. Could we teach them how to tag them well enough to use them? Um, I, somebody's probably figured it out because we do have the Teachers Paying Teachers website, but I mean. Um, well, and there are other open examples of something similar. Mm -hmm. And I think I think so tagging is an important issue there. Um, could we could we list some of those? I mean, if if you know somebody sees this and hears this and says, "Okay, I want to do this," what do I do tomorrow morning? <laughs> Email Karen. Yeah, well, Karen has a great resource. <laughs> you can throw Google Doc link in there for us, Karen. Yeah, I'll put it in there. But I do think that you know Verena's really pushed me on like. There's tons of repositories and tons of stuff out there, but that doesn't change practice. Mm -hmm. And Paul, I'm interested in for youth voices where teachers have embraced the model. Is there something you would identify that's been effective in getting to that point? Or are there other ways? Like we we're talking in the chat a little bit about more about mentoring. What what are the pivotal things that move people toward this practice wise? Use, using the stuff themselves as students, believe it or not. I mean, and that's a basic mm -hmm. writing project principle, right? So in, instead of first using a, an open educational resource as a teacher, what if you used it as a student and saw how that worked? I think, but, but yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that people, when they see that, so we call the missions on Youth Voices as closest to what our repository looks like. Um, but then, you know, I mean, the most success we had in one workshop recently, where we opened it up to both, our missions are now open to both students and teachers to be able to post, and we just said, think of your favorite assignment you ever did, right? and recreate that, but, but make it student-facing, make it um, available for other teachers to use. So just, just working through the creative process and building that. So, you know, those are some of the things. And I'd say also, um, often I'll take somebody's uh, blog post to their students and recreate it for them and then email them and say, hey, this is what it might look like if it yes. were an open resource for other people to, to use. But it's just a matter of time and huge. experience. But yeah. uh -huh. I think that's huge, taking something and, and sort of doing the legwork for somebody or saying, this is a MOOC experience I'm having right now, is saying like, oh, this thing you did would be great in this other context or other people could benefit. And usually everybody's like, oh, I'd love to do that. They just either never thought of it or they didn't know how or they didn't have it's the time. It's almost a rhetorical question then too, isn't it? I mean, like how you create these things, hmm. I think. Well, when, when social constructivism is huge right now, the idea of constructing, yeah, I'm going to say it's huge. It's the newest trend, shall we say, but it's new, not new. Um, but it... The, the idea that we have to create a common cultural environment so we're all speaking the same language and, and same lingo. So, like, I'm going to bring up David Price's book. I don't know if you've read this, Open. Very awesome book, and he brings up the idea of the global learning commons. And what I liked about it was, well, that works with the learning commons idea that all the schools are doing right now. So when they think of a global learning commons, it makes sense that you're sharing that one step out. So I think part of our issue issue is creating bridges or connections between what's going on and what could happen, exactly what you're alluding to. And, and that is that cultural ground and creating common, common culture, common knit words, common glossary. Anyway, that was my thoughts on that. So make that more concrete in, in terms of an online community. Since this is my personal thing I wanted to get out of this conversation tonight. You mean the blog idea that we're talking about? No, how do you build these bridges in an online community yeah. space? Oh, that's how, I mean, it's, it, that's one thing I've been wondering for a while is how do you build authentic community, you know? <laughs> and it's, you, you can't. Um, you know, it, in, in, in terms of your first question, I think that it's, um, you got to get proof of concept. You got to show people what this looks like in order to get them excited and involved. In order to build community, um, I think you have to, because a lot of people have asked me and, and everybody on this panel over the years, how do you build community online? Um, I think it has to be value added. You have to make people want to do it. Um, many of you have seen and been involved in the Walk My World project. You know, Greg <laughs> labeled it the accidental MOOC, and that's what it is, is basically 
it's it's it might be successful right now. Okay, it's just fun. But part of it is that we have a series of students that are forced into doing this because it's part of their class. You know, and then we have another group of people that are involved and interested because it's a very exciting experience. So I don't know if we would have it, you know, there is community. There is uh, a willingness of people to get involved. People are, are interacting. And so I've been wondering what has created that community, you know, and then I was one part of it was we're, we're requiring people to join and get involved, but not all people. So it's it's like how do you create culture? How do you create community? It, you know, if you want to be organic, it has to be organic when you create it. I think opt in is a huge piece of it, and I think the the fun aspect of it, and we saw that with CL MOOC too. If you yeah. give people fun ways to get into something, CL MOOC is a perfect <laughs> example. I mean, you still. Kevin Hodgson sent me an email the other day. There are still reverberations from the CL MOOC, you know, and we're coming up on a year after. And there's all these other things that were affected and created by the CL MOOC. So, you know, I would be interested in talking to the original organizational team and say, okay, how did you guys create culture? Why don't you ask Karen? Yeah, Karen? Well, it, the fun Karen, aspect, I mean, it was very intentional around the fun thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking even of Twitter. Like, we all just live on Twitter and I think, you know, get huge value out of it. It's hard to get people to make, and that, to me, that is open learning. I mean, that's not how everyone uses Twitter. Yeah. But how do you get people who don't get Twitter to make that leap? I actually stopped requiring it in my classrooms. I tried yeah. it, you know, back in 2009 or 10. I can't remember exactly where I was like, oh, we're going to have a class hashtag and we're going to use Twitter. And, you're gonna, and, like, it was a disaster because there was yeah. no value for the, for the users. So in the next year, what I try to do is I just took three um, I, three widgets and put it on my class website of popular like widgets and said, hey, there is this thing. Check it out if you want. Um, and I had more students join when it was opt-in versus like, oh, I'm going to make this fake hashtag for this class and we're going to pretend that you know we're all going to do Twitter because that's not what it's like. I do have them in my... Um, one of my classes, I have them. They can either lurk, but they have to watch two chats or an event, like be it the Super Bowl on Twitter or The Voice or Ed Chat, you know, and then just write a reflection post on that. But I, I stopped, like, doing, like, this is my class Super hashtag. Super Bowl or Ed Chat? That's cool. <laughs> I like the say? range there. The Super Bowl or Ed Chat. I like the range there. That's well, that's right. Difference. I wanted to give, like, buy-in. Same difference. I, you know, like, if, <laughs> sure, if you watch The Voice every night and you want to – you want to, you know, because I'm, it's, it's a class on community and, and new media. Um, but I, I want them to kind of see that without me trying to fake it. Because uh, my, half the kids aren't on Twitter. And I'm not going to make them, you know. Yeah. It's, to me, it's not Twitter by forcing them to use my, this is the EDU 106 hashtag. And you have to do it. And I want five Twitter posts a day. That's, that's the exact opposite of what. But there's like, I, I did a whole blog post. There's no wrong way to do Twitter. So if, you're doing that with your class and it works, more power to you. I just found it didn't work for me. I had two reading classes, um, you know, last year. One class, I, it was mandatory that they would blog every week and, you know, it was mandatory they would look at each other's posts and comment. And then the other class, I would give them prompts and if they wanted to respond, they had more interaction and more dialogue and commentary from the students that didn't have to. Um, Nate, once again, you dropped a bomb in the text. Uh, can you explain yeah, that? Really talk more, Nate. <laughs> yeah. We are yeah, getting close to our end time here, but yes, go with me. Oh, okay. So, I mean, one of the things I was just saying is that, um, you know, if you want to share culture and, you know, you create culture around open learning, um, part of that is sharing the underlying metaphors that sort of guide your practice in being open. And I, I think a lot of the same way about, you know, like what – how you would decide to make um, some of your intellectual property, you know, open licensed. It's that intellectual property is itself a metaphor of, of owning things, and if, it's not the only way you can think of, of how you would connect to ideas. I mean, we, I've written about how if you think of your ideas as like your children instead of your property, then you necessarily just sort of treat them differently, and, and you want them to go out and make friends and, and have, you know, an exciting life even after you're gone. 
I, I just we tried to integrate Ian and I we integrated our course with Karen's course just to promote her I know how to make community and we've lost our group they're gone like the but we gained them <laughs> we stole them and 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 I think so when we think about community they were already tight before they started they're a little cohort yeah. but they would they were not forced in any way except they had to look and lurk they did not have to interact there were no set guidelines yeah. we just wanted to see what would happen it was a and we have literally lost them like we're gonna have to pull them back for the end of term but and the next, just take that to class Maybe no but I mean class. the nice thing is that you know Verena and I talked about it and we said okay we're at the point where many of them in a couple months, one more trimester, they'll be done. Mm -hmm. And so they need to go out and they need to be the experts. And so they're all bright, incredible people, um, and they they were apprehensive. You know, they, they looked were. at the DL MOOC and they're looking around like, we don't belong with these people. And Varina and I are in the background saying, no, no, you definitely do belong with these people. Your voice needs to work. We're cheerleaders. And, and now on Monday, one of them is going to be on our panel, yeah. which yeah. is so awesome. It is awesome. And so what would be on MOOC for like a week or two? Well, that's the thing is that... Well, we didn't really do it, though. Either. Yeah, you, really, we, it, it, you personalized it and took it on yourself, and that's what all this is about. Well, we got involved, and, and then as I saw them taking off, I backed out. We backed like, out. I don't want to be, no yeah. be in the deal MOOC with, with the students in my class, because then all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's the teacher, there's the instructor. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. You're, you're the experts now, and, and they're, they're flourishing. You know, and so they're amazing, and we have tracked it. We and we've shown Karen, and she gets all the data. It's just amazing how far they've come. So you have something on you, in you. Your aura is community, mm. Karen. <laughs> Thank you, Verena. I think we should close on that note. No, I'm just kidding. But we are we are running out of time, so I want to give everybody an opportunity to do sort of uh, tweet length final comments. Did you want to add something, Paul? No, I'll, I'll do that at the end. Yeah. It's cool. Anybody want to start? Um, I'll start. I think that we talked about a lot about building community, and you know, I think community involves culture and membership. Um, if you force someone into a community, we had a word for that. It was called slavery. Um, and so I don't think you can force community. You, you have to build opportunities to have multiple portals of entry in your community, um, and allow it, the networks to spread across different spaces. Um, and that is how I kind of look at open. And social networks don't attack Greg for minimizing slavery there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see what happens tomorrow. <laughs> oh, you mean my three followers, yeah. I'm listening to Marina talk about, oh, I get so attacked. I'm like, man, I would love for somebody to attack you. I am somebody oh, with phone oh, books here. Oh, phone books here. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I like what Peggy said in the chat about expectations. I think, um, I remember I was in some study for MOOCs about my goals and, and what goals I had. Well, I don't ever have any goals. I'm not very organized like that at all. But if I go in with no expectations, kind of like we did our course here, we didn't know which way it was going to go, they led the learning, they being the learners, and we actually all ended up learning together. So the expectation piece has really been curious to me, or I, I caught on to today. So thanks, Peggy. Here, I'll jump on that next. Um, you know, my sort of tweet link um, end here is thanks for having me. And, um, you know, if you haven't tried doing open education, you know, partly in the way that we're doing it right now, go give it a try. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, think about any risks there might be, uh, you know, and, and see what level you're willing to put yourself out there and then, then give it a try. Nate, what where, where, where train are you near? Yeah. <laughs> I live near a, near a train track. I'm right downtown Corvallis, Oregon, and uh, yeah. right next to the river. The train has to go by. Hand. That's the trains of change. <laughs> there you go. Ian. I would say, um, first of all, thank you to the panel you know, for pushing my own thinking. Um, and I, I want to go back to the original question. What is open? You know, and if open is an attitude, we need to provide opportunities to you know, educate others empower you know the people that we work with and advocate for open uh, in what we do cool. and, and I wanted to end um, by saying that last week we had 10 teachers 
I think about 10, um, from Youth Voices, who use Youth Voices. And one of the ways we build community is by showing up here every week. So showing up is a big thing, <laughs> you know, um, and, and inviting new friends all the time, but then always, uh, you know, minding the gap with old friends too. Um, so, and that, that Youth Voices community is a community because we're building something together, so that feels like an important part of community to mention also. But thank you for coming here and talking about something that I'm less familiar with. And thanks, Karen, for inviting all of your friends, or some of your friends, not all your friends. Um, we uh, just just to mention, we started this uh, webcast um, several years ago um, at the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network, and um, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier started that community. So thank you all and. We'll see you sometime in the future here on Wednesday night. Thanks, Karen. And before Thanks, we Sarah. close, yeah, please, we, al we always thank Jeff and Dave, but I want to yeah. tonight. I want to thank um, Paul and Monica and Chris for always doing this show. We are here every Wednesday, and this is one of the best examples of open learning that I know of. So thank you very much, Paul. Bye. And thanks everybody for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks Good all. Night.